Turn in your Bibles, if you would, today with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and as we're considering still a series that we've been looking at, and I don't know how many of you have been watching online, but we have been looking at a topic entitled Living Different in the World, Answering the Call to Be Different in the World. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Because I, the Lord, your God, am holy, you are to be holy. You are to be holy. I can't see who's running the sound, but if you can turn me down just a little, I'm getting a lot of echo here. Are you living a holy life? Is your life uh, exhibiting anything that's different than the culture of this world? Do your conversations sound different uh, than the conversations of the world? Does your life attitude and actions express to the world that you are different from them? God, Jehovah, is different from all other gods. Now, you and I know there is no other God apart from him. However, the world has made many gods in their own image. And so our God has called us to live holy lives, pleasing to him. And that requires of us three things that we've considered over the last month or so. First of all, it, does, it requires of us a holy longing. Isaiah said in his writing, My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. Does your heart exhibit uh, the personality of being a person that longs for God in your life? Are you consumed with the desire for God? Uh, that's what it means to be different. Uh, to have a holy longing in your heart that you desire your relationship with God to be a first priority in your journey that we call life. Secondly, answering the call to be different requires for us holy living. There should be a distinct difference in us and in the people of this world who do not name Jesus Christ. And thirdly, it requires of us a life of holy loving. Now, last week I mentioned four different words in the Greek language that mean love. And we would be wise to look back at those for a moment. The first one, and certainly you would think of that on a day like Valentine's Day, is the word eros. It speaks of romantic love. In the Bible, we see that well described in the Song of Solomon. Uh, the language is there is between two people who are in passionate love for one another. Then there's the word storge, S-T-O-R-G, long E, and that's the word for family love. It's the kind of word that a mother feels for a child, a father for his children, or children for parents or grandparents, storge. It is family love. And then there's phileo love. The city of Philadelphia is named based on that term, the city of brotherly love. It's the kind of love that a fireman feels for other firemen and policemen for uh, other policemen. It's the brotherhood of fellowship. And then there's that word agape, which is a word that the New Testament brings to us that speaks of unconditional, sacrificial, giving love. And it really is rooted in the Hebrew word hesed, which speaks of God's covenantal love for his people, that God is steadfast, enduring, that he is sure towards his people and he's unmovable. And so that love that we know to be agape is a back and forth love. We love as God has loved us. And we love God with the love that he has loved us with. So you and I are to be defined by being a people of love. In every circumstance, we should be defined as being a people of love. Now, Nick read our text from last week to us this morning. And I want to very quickly run back through uh, how to define love as the New Testament does. Now, last week I mentioned to you that 1 Corinthians 13 is not exhaustive in its definition of love, but it takes a pretty strong stab at it to give us an idea of what agape love is like. Love is patient. It means it doesn't lose heart. It perseveres. It buries the offenses of another. 
Love is kind. It's exactly what it says. It is kind towards other people uh, in the way it acts. It's not jealous. When love sees the lives of others who are maybe successful or doing well, love does not boil over with envy. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it's not heated with envy or hatred or anger towards others who are doing well. Love is not, uh, it's not jealous. It doesn't brag. It doesn't embellish oneself excessively in the world. It doesn't make up its resume and inflate it. Love is not arrogant. It doesn't puff itself up. It's not lofty or proud. In fact, it's what Paul meant when he said, don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought. And the way that you come to that aspect of love is to always look to the standard of Jesus Christ every morning, every midday, every evening to, to measure yourself against the person of Jesus. And then you'll just come to a point of gratitude. Lord, thank you that you would love me and allow me to be a part of your kingdom work and to be used. Lord, help me not to elevate myself as more important than those that it's my privilege to serve. Uh, it does not act unbecomingly. It does not act in a way that is not fitting uh, for a Christian. You know, we would all say that uh, there are times, for example, our grandmothers... You do not want your grandmother to act unbecomingly or unfitting of the role that she has in your life. A grandmother ought to act like a grandmother. She ought to carry herself with dignity uh, and with elegance and with respect. But to act unbecomingly is to act in a manner that opposes the lifestyle that you profess to believe and live. It doesn't seek its own doesn't strive for its own nor demand something for itself from other people. Y'all, a Christian, very simply put, that loves, elevates others before him or herself. Uh, even as I think about the role that many of you have, and I've been praying for you that teach in public or private schools, you always need to ask God to give you the strength to elevate and put the children that you serve and their families before you. And I'm very well aware that that can be difficult at times. I have a wife who's a teacher. I have many church members that are teachers. I have interaction with administrators, and I know well how you're treated. And often you're the reason a child's not doing well, or you're the reason a child is misbehaving in a parent's uh, mind. They have not come to grips with little Johnny or Susie is not the perfect child uh, living in a perfect world. But somehow you become uh, the, uh, the target for the issues with little Johnny. But the fact is, you want to elevate that child as important. I was talking with a family in our school recently, and I assured this family, I said, I want you to understand how much we value your child and how important he or she is to us, and the reason we're doing what we're doing is because of that. Love is not provoked. It's not aroused to anger. You talk about something I've had to learn in my life as a pastor is not to be aroused to anger by the actions and the attitudes of Christians along the way, especially those that I would serve as pastor. You have to come to a point that you don't let people push your buttons where you respond. Now, where's the hardest place to live this out? At home, right? I'll never forget, I share this with you openly and transparently, I've told you before, but I came home one day and I honestly was ticked off about something that had taken place in the office that day and I kind of went off on the kids and Charles, who never says much of anything, he's not a, he's not a person to challenge authority uh, often. Uh, now, Lauren is opposite of that. She'll challenge anybody at any time, but, but Charles looked at me and he said, Dad, I don't know what your problem is and what stressed you out today at the church but it's obvious something has. And he said, don't bring that blank home to us. And you know what? He was right. And we have to learn to not be aroused to anger, nor to take our anger out on others. And the reality is probably everybody in this room at some point or another is guilty of going off on the wrong person, right? 
Uh, and because you couldn't go off on the person that you wanted to, you go off on the person that you ought not have gone off on. And so it's not angered. It's not provoked. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. Folks, we need to remember that in our marriages, in our relationships within the church. You don't need to be quick to call up 50 things your husband did wrong 25 years ago. Forget the stuff. Get over it and move on. Because when you keep opening up that list and records of wrongs, it just stirs up more trouble. It doesn't calculate. It doesn't count over. But in fact, it covers over a multitude of sins. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. You don't go back over and over again something someone else has done wrong against you. It does not delight in evil. This is something in our time that seems like many have forgotten. We're not to delight in evil. We're not to delight in people uh, speaking evil against each other, acting evil, but rather uh, we are to live righteous lives. And then this, uh, we didn't get to this last week, so let me run through these. Love rejoices with the truth. It respects God and it delights in the execution of God's purposes in Jesus Christ. Does your life delight in the things of God? Do you delight in the fact that God is different than the world culture in which we live in? Do you delight in that God has a holy and righteous purpose and plan for your life, as difficult as it is to live it out? Love rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices when it hears the truth. Love always protects. Love covers over with silence. Y'all, sometimes love does not enter into the conversation of negativity. This is something the church needs to understand. While the world is throwing darts at the church, or Christians specifically, you and I don't need to join in and continue to heap up those coals. Rather, at times, we need to cover something to keep off that which threatens it. In a, in a time of, uh, of uncertainty, in a time of war, if you will, what would a parent do but throw their life down over their child to cover them? That's what we ought to do with the gospel. Love protects, it covers. Love always trusts and believes, intellectually and in action. Love always hopes. I was talking with someone the other day and they made this statement about a child that's struggling with a substance abuse. The parent said to me, I've just lost hope. I don't think there will ever be a change. I've given up. And I was able to call out Avery and Helen Harville's name. This parent has only been in this place for 38 long years, a child dealing with substance abuse. But you know what I was able to say to them? Listen, don't give up. Avery and Helen Harville walked that road for 45 years before their son knew freedom from substance abuse. Don't quit. Don't give up. Folks, I want to tell you today that love, the love of Jesus Christ, never, ever gives up on a person. Never give up. Don't give up until they breathe their last breath. In fact, if somebody's rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ and they are on their deathbed and they cannot appear to hear or to respond, you just keep sharing the gospel with them. You invite them when they cannot audibly or with their eyes respond at all and plead with them to accept Jesus. I'm telling you by faith, I believe that God redeems even those who no longer can respond. If we were to ask Cha-Cha today, who's a medical doctor, do medical doctors think that people can still hear even when they can't respond? And the answer is always what, Cha-Cha? Absolutely, yes. So what should we do? We ought to invest the gospel. And so if you're ever in that situation, speak life into someone's ears that no longer can respond. And trust God to work. And you know what? When we get to heaven, we'll know whether or not that last moment brought them to life. Listen, I think the thief on the cross 
is the greatest example of that. Even in the last hours, love always hopes. Don't give up on someone. Even someone that hates you and has been hateful to you, don't give up on them. Always seek to build the relationship. Love always perseveres. It remains, it abides, it endures, it bears bravely and calmly. Listen, as I look around this room, I think of many of you who have persevered through difficult times in your own marriages, in your own families, in our church. You've persevered and you've stayed the course. It does not give up. It does not quit. Love goes the long distance the whole way. And I have to remind you all, we are not home yet. You see, we can't expect our church to be perfect because we have yet to be perfected personally. And if we've not yet been perfected, then we're the imperfect part of our church. Yes, we are being perfected, but not yet perfected. And so we must realize we go the whole way with each other. And we don't give up or quit. Love never fails. What that means is it doesn't fall down. It doesn't succumb to the attack of evil spirits or or fall dead suddenly. It never comes up empty. You know, if I was writing a movie, what I would want to say to you is, listen, you be that soldier, you be that warrior that crawls over the finish line, that takes your last breath as you're falling over the threshold of heaven. Don't give up. Keep crawling Keep groaning, keep, keep digging into the soil. I saw one of our little infants uh, this week on a social media platform, and she looked like a little warrior. She uh, is a, a four-month-old or thereabouts, and she's learned to take her arms and, and work and carry herself across the hardwood floor. Our little granddaughter, uh, Marilee, is learning. She's just rocking back and forth and everybody's becking her. Come on, Marilee. Come on, Marilee. You can do it. I told Lauren recently, I said, you better quit encouraging her to do it because in a few months, you're going to wish that she wasn't when you're chasing her around the house. Y'all, love does not quit. And so today, I want you to look with me at at, uh, John chapter 15 and verse 9. And this is what uh, we want to consider today. And that is that the word, so, so we've looked at this about loving. God's word decrees a life of love, Matthew 22 and John 13. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you what? Have love one for another. All men will know. Jesus said you're to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And secondly, love your neighbor as yourself. God's word clearly decrees that you and I live lives of love. No matter what anyone else does, God calls you and me to live a life of love. Secondly, God's word displays a life of love. If you were here last week, we talked about the fact that it is Jesus' life that is a perfect display of perfect love. You want to know what love looks like? Look into the Gospels at the life of Jesus. John talks about that just a glimpse is all we have seen of him, but Jesus loved. Right now, if we had not had the coronavirus, I would be standing on the precipice in Nazareth, Israel. The sun would have just set. And I would be encouraging people in the chill of the afternoon to go get back on the bus. And then we would drive and make our way down to the Sea of Galilee. Y'all, the Sea of Galilee is a marker of a life of love for me. I think about the woman with the issue of blood. Twelve years she'd been an outcast from society. Twelve years she'd been unable to go to the synagogue. But at one moment in her life, love appeared with healing in his wings. And she reached out for the hem of Jesus' garment. And the power of healing flowed from him and changed her life forever. 
Y'all, if you want to know what a life of love looks like, you look to Jesus. And let me remind you, Jesus didn't lose hope and he didn't give up hope in people. Jesus did not respond to hateful words with hateful words, but with love. And Think about Jesus' life. It displayed love perfectly for us. Thirdly, we looked last week, God's word defines love. That's what we just did in 1 Corinthians 13. It's just an introduction to what love is and how it's defined. But today I want to share with you about how God's word directs a life of love. God's word directs a life of love. Let's look in John 15 and verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Very simply put, Jesus said, the way that I'm loving you is learned. I learned it from the Father. I remember when Ben was a little boy, someone took a picture of the two of us walking away from the building, and we were stride for stride. And then I've seen videos of us. And when Ben was a little boy, people would say he walks just like you. He looks just like you. He acts just like you. And the reality is that should be said of us in relationship to Jesus. We should look and act and love just like Jesus did. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Y'all, it is so simply clear. God calls us to love by obeying his commands. Today, if you'll look at our 21 days of prayer, the scripture from Colossians, Clothe yourselves with humility. Clothe yourselves with compassion. Be a people that are forgiving. Y'all, it is a trained life that loves. Train yourself, Paul told Timothy. Look at verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now, I can't expect you to understand what I'm about to say to you. I've told you before that, you know, Nick's kind of a happy, clappy person. I watched him again today waving his arms as we were worshiping, and my prayer was, Lord, would you give me that kind of energy again? Nick, you didn't get on a, did you, Nick, did you by chance this morning lay down on a back stretcher and work on your back? No, you probably got you something to eat, kissed Jessie, probably hugged her, picked her up, carried her again across the threshold. Listen, here's what I want to tell you today. When I thought about us getting back together, I stood in my closet putting the little collar stays in my shirt and I started to weep. Because like Paul, I want to tell you something. If I were to drop dead today, You are my crown and joy. You are the prize of my life apart from knowing Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate prize, but the blessing that he has given me to grow old as the pastor of this church, there is nothing that compares to it apart from my wife and children and my own salvation. When I think about Salem Baptist Church, I am moved to the core of my being with gratitude and thanksgiving to God and a sense of awe that he would grant me the privilege to have done life with you for the last 25 years, to literally see your children grow up and Craig to see Connor grow a mustache. Who would have dreamed and been thinking about a mustache when we had little Connor in our arms up here dedicating him. To see little Alan Steele, that's what I've always called Avery, 
grow from this precious, tiny little bond, blonde-headed smile to a maturing young woman who loves Jesus. From that first meal at Scott and Melissa Heaven's home when our kids were about two feet tall and throwing things at each other and running around the room and Lauren and Cam arguing with each other to praying over Cam as he was loading the moving van to go to Arkansas recently. And on the list goes. Listen, folks, what Jesus was saying is God has granted all of you to me. Now live a life of love as he's called me to live. He calls you to live and love one another. That's what he said. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. And then he says this, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. We have seen far too many police officers die in the line of duty over these last few years, haven't we? Just think about FBI agents that were shot down by a literal pervert recently. You remember I said we live in a world of crooks and perverts? I mean, that's literally what the text of Philippians means. And these FBI agents went to, uh, to bring a warrant on a man who was involved uh, in child sexual exploitation. And he was waiting for them, and he saw them coming, and he shot them down. When we hear this verse, we most often think about putting our life on the line for other people, and most often in death, right? Right? I think we can paraphrase it rightly this way. Greater love has no one than this, than that he would live his life for his friends. Get up every day and live your life for Jesus. Romans chapter 12. Put yourself on the altar. But every morning when you wake up, say, Lord, for your glory, I'm going to give my life away. I'm going to live for other people. I mentioned Dr. Cha-Cha today. I'm so thankful for Pauline and Cha-Cha and their three precious boys being a part of our church. God was gracious to us, and they were here for almost a year before I really came to know Cha-Cha's heart and how he loves God and loves people, loves the church. But Cha-Cha, my prayer for you is that every morning in this wearisome time of the coronavirus as you put on your PPE and you go back into that, uh, to that battle zone of coronavirus that you every day would say, God, let me live for you today in the care of these people. Teachers, as you go back into the building with the students, God, let me live my life for you today by seeking to influence this little child whose home may be coming apart or has already come apart. Let me be a source of love and light to them and let me be the shining bright star that helps them to know their way along the way. Y'all, it's not that hard if we'll just model our lives after Jesus. Do you know in this coronavirus, I appreciate people like Debbie Rogers all the more. To know that I can pick up my phone and text or call Debbie and say, listen, Debbie, we've got this person coming in to the cath lab. Would you or Amanda, would you all pray with them and be there for them? And the response that people are giving is so significant. Uh, Debbie probably never saw herself as being a pastor, but y'all, for the last 11 months, Debbie's been on the front lines, not just dealing with people that are sick, but being a ministry partner for us when we cannot go. Sarah has been there, and so we all have to see ourselves as being true ministers of the gospel, and we must live a life of love. Greater love is no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You remember Paul said, imitate us as we imitate him, basically? 
Listen, the things that you see in me or anyone on our staff that look like and live like Jesus imitate those things. But the many things in me and in others that don't look like Jesus forgive those things and don't, don't do those things. Don't you wish that you could say that you lived a life so perfect that you'd never have to say what I just said? But y'all, there's some things in me that you ought not to imitate but there's nothing in Jesus that you ought not to imitate. So as we imitate him, then we can imitate one another. He said, uh, I no longer call you servants, but I've called you friend. He said, you did not choose me, but I've chosen you, and I have appointed you to go and to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Now I just want to spend the last few minutes of our time talking about the different areas and arenas that we can exhibit the love of God directed by his word. God's word directs us to live a life of love. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 3 says this, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Solomon wrote these words to his children. You see, Solomon had abandoned true love and true faithfulness. He was unfaithful to God and to his wife. Wife, Remember, he loved many women, foreign, and they led him astray. So he says to his children at the end of life, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Psalm 23, verse 3, David said, uh, The Lord leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Psalm 119, verse 105, Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I I have uh, fallen and I've confirmed it that I will, I have made an oath is what he says. I've made an oath and I have confirmed it that I will follow you in righteousness. Y'all, God's word directs us to live a life of love all throughout. Put on compassion, put on kindness, put on love, put on gentleness. Over and over again, God's word directs us to a life of love. You see, we may not be called to die for anybody, but we are called to live for everybody, a life of love. Now, how are we to do that? I want to just give you several examples. And y'all, I want to just wet your, wet your palate and encourage you, be reading the New Testament. While you're reading all the books that help you with spiritual growth and they are great, Let me remind you, read the Bible first of all. You can scan the epistles every day before you go out in the morning or before you go to bed. Just skim through 1 Timothy. Go through the book of Ephesians. Become familiar enough with it. Let key words jump out at you and they will spur you on to a life of love. And it doesn't take that long to read God's word. You see, your life of love is to be exhibited in your personal witness. When someone looks at your life, they ought to be able quickly to see that you are different. That you are different. Even from other Christians. Now, this isn't about boastfulness. It's not about pride. It's not about arrogance. But, y'all, we ought to live with humility. We should always be lowering ourselves and elevating Christ in our hearts and others around us. And being a loving witness can be as simple as being a person who is civil in your political discussions. Be civil. Don't be hateful. Don't be angry. Don't be 
unkind in the way that you express your convictions, I often think to myself, is what I'm going to say going to help somebody to become more like Jesus or seek to reach them with the gospel or is it going to cause them to go further? So be civil. Be respectful. Let your light so shine in such a way that men may see your good deeds and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Be respectful in your witness. Be a person of integrity and character in the way that you carry yourself. You can love others and God's word directs us to in our words. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. This is something you ought to to mark down very carefully in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 4. It's a command. It is not a suggestion. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, what did Jesus say about the mouth? He said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not, by your words, grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with envy or every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. Y'all, God's word is serious in directing us. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth except that which is good for the edification of others. Now, if we had time today, I would like to do a little study here by asking you to give examples of how someone built you up with their words or tore you down with their words that has had an impact on you in your life. And every one of us could do it. You probably can think back to your childhood of someone who spoke hateful words to you that were harmful and that still impact you possibly today. But you also can probably think back to your childhood to someone who has spoken strong words to you that still impact you today. You know, when I think about my parents, and they are uh, just like me, certainly flawed people with many weaknesses. But when I think about my childhood, I don't remember my parents ever squelching my dreams or longings to do something big. In fact, they challenged me to take steps, to to take risk, to do things that would be significant in impacting others. And I could give you examples. I remember two ladies specifically today as I stand here to speak. And, you know, if we started listing preachers, I'm probably not on most people's top ten greatest preachers in, in human history. But you know, when I think about Mildred Woodard and Myra Marsh and Dolores Burkett, and I could just go on and on, primarily women, older women, who in my life invested words of affirmation and edification that strengthened me and helped me to do what I'm doing today. I've told you many times that Mildred Woodard and some of her family, I would guarantee you, is watching today if she's not watching. She told me when I was 18 years old, you're going to be the next Billy Graham. I've never forgotten those words. When I heard Myra Marsh tell me when I was 17 years old and I finished my first message, and y'all, it was terrible but I read the scripture and therefore it was successful. And Myra came and told me that I reminded her of her husband when he was young as a preacher. 
when a man made a comment to me when I was in my 20s and first pastoring full-time in the presence of Miriam's dad, and he was contrasting Miriam's dad's giftedness to preach and my inexperienced preaching, and when he got finished, Miriam's dad looked at him and said, when he's my age, he ought to be a far better preacher than I am today. How many times have I told Nick that he has far uh, exceeded uh, where I was at his age when he speaks and shares the Word of God? Why? Because words of affirmation and edification build up. Words that do not build up tear down. And you know, sometimes there is a time for tearing down. But then what about our walk? God's Word directs us in our walk. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says, Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. It's a, it's a term that relates to scales. Walk in a manner that is worthy of your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. As you're known for, for the person of Jesus Christ, balance your life in accordance with his life. Walk worthy of the calling. When you walk in life, do people see Jesus in you? Now, it's not necessarily said in this way, but it's written all over the pages if you correlate it to today. Right in keeping with love. When you put your fingers on the keypad, and uh, most of us will today, and put something out in a public arena, when you put words on the Internet, ask the question, is this building people up for the kingdom of Christ, or is it tearing people down? When you write and when you post, do so with the intent of reaching someone, raising someone up, or reaping a harvest for the gospel. When you love, God's word directs us in our lives as it relates to our wealth. All of us in this room, uh, unless I would be shocked, all of us, according to world standards, are wealthy people. What did Solomon tell his children, chapter 3, verse 9? Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, don't despise the Lord's discipline. Listen, I don't know what took me so long, but Ben is already serving in a church over at Beach Haven in Athens. He's going over there for college Bible studies. Lauren participated in the church actively when she was in Carrollton and ministries. But when I was talking with Ben the other day, I said, Ben, I don't want you to let me forget. Uh, I said, we need to give every month to the ministry of Beach Haven Baptist Church. You see, Ben is a college student that is benefiting from the ministry of that church. And while we're giving a tithe to Salem for 25 years, our children, our child specifically now, is being blessed by the ministry of Beach Haven, and it is only fitting that Miriam and I give to that ministry and encourage Ben to do so. And I was thankful that Ben said, Dad, just so that you know, I'm already tithing to Beach Haven each week. And as I get money, he was paid recently for playing at a disciple now, and he's already tithed to that church. So we bear a responsibility, not just here, but to other ministries that are advancing the gospel of Christ and helping our family to mature in Christ. It would be wrong for us not to invest in that church. And so if you have college kids, I want to encourage you to be thinking about investing in that church where they're going with your wealth. I could read other passages. But y'all invest with love in your work. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 uh, talks about that. Colossians 3, 17 says this. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. Verse 23, whatever you do, Work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. So what I've done today is share with you 
how God's word directs us in a life of love in specific areas. Our witness, with our words, even our writing, the way that we walk, that we carry ourselves with our wealth and with our work. And y'all, it only takes a little bit to encourage someone. And may I tell you that most people are not being encouraged on a regular basis. Is that a fair statement? Most people are having their negative traits pointed out to them on a regular basis. Most of the time in the work environment, people aren't celebrating somebody's successes. They're celebrating somebody's negatives. And so I want to encourage you to be different. Let God's word direct you in your life, which means you've got to be in God's word. Now, musicians, y'all come on up as I just do a little case study here. Don't ask for God's will to be shown you by doing the open and point method. In other words, Lord, what is your will for me today? Put your finger there because you know the Bible says Judas went out and hanged himself. You don't want to deal with that. But listen, if I open the New Testament anywhere, and let's just flip, here's Hebrews uh, chapter 11, and there's verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, God was com- he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Y'all, every word in this word is good for the edification of your life. Maybe it tears something down so that you can rebuild on it. You know, that's what we're doing at Keys Ferry. We've torn a lot down so that we can rebuild on a strong foundation. So what are we to do? We're to live differently in our lives. How? By having a holy longing. Lord, my heart yearns for you as a deer pants for the water. We're to, have whole, we're to be people with holy living. Our lives are to be different, and we're to do so with holy loving. And we're to, that way we are different from the world. We're not just religious legalists who are fulfilling a bunch of laws with a burden, some life, but we are doing it in love because Jesus modeled it for us. Folks, when people talk about our church family, I hope that they talk about people who are different than other people because we live as Jesus lived in the world. Let's pray together.